program is Mercy Udom. She is a great woman of valor, a woman of God, a mother, a wife. You know, she's a proof of the efficacy of faith in God and the power of prayer in home building, an impactor and a business consultant. Mercy believes in the workable, workability of marriage through prayer and education. She is a nutritionist, a serial entrepreneur, a life coach, a marriage counselor, a public speaker, a mother to four adorable, sweet children, a wife to a husband. Above all, she's a minister and a child of God. Welcome, Mercy Udon. Over to you now, please. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I am delighted to be amongst you today, and it's indeed a privilege uh, to be speaking on The Reconciler with Maggie Anthony. Um, I have been on her program before, and it was so profound. And when she called me on this, I just praised God. I couldn't even say no, you know. So thank you very much for the opportunity, The Reconciler, for this uh, chance given to me once again uh, to be able to make impact on lives, marriages. So I'm going to take you straight into today's um, teaching, and I would like to share my screen with you. I hope uh, that is okay. I'm going to start by sharing my screen with you. Just a moment. Oh, you have disabled screen sharing. So is it possible to allow screen sharing from the admin? Is it possible? Let me let me work on it. I, I, I never thought I did. Okay, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. All right, so while you're doing so, I'm going to start. All right, so today I was commissioned to speak on ingredients of love for a successful marriage. I don't think I need to introduce myself much anymore. Thank you for that powerful introduction. But I would like to say that uh, I am a businesswoman and I love to walk in obedience with the leading of the Holy Spirit. So I am sold out for the Lord, and that is who I am. My name is Mercy Udom once again. Yes, to begin, um, I would like to acknowledge uh, Offray. Thank you for your time. Thank you to Maggie for everything you have shared. You know, when the Spirit of God moves, you see all the assignment works in sync. We have really synchronized, even though we didn't talk about anything or share tips on what we're going to share. The only thing I received was to share on the topic, ingredients of love for a successful marriage. And while I was examining, what are the determining factors for a successful marriage? First of all, a question came to mind to say, why do we even consider getting married? Why do people consider marriage? Is it just because the scripture says so? No. Now I'm beginning to unveil my findings. Then I'm going to tell you what the ingredients of sustainable marriage is. Because for you to love, you must know the act of love. Love is an act. Love is not isolated. It's not something that drops from the sky. Love requires practice. Love requires embrace. Love requires knowledge and wisdom of God. So it doesn't just exist in isolation. So love is an act. Now we have come to find out in my finding that sometimes most people get married for the wrong reasons. It could be for money. It could be for sex. It could be as a result of family pressure, peer pressure or even for the convenience of it, if you may say. Let me give you my own personal life example. Um, 
I didn't marry in, in the part of Africa where we come from, especially when you're a Christian, you are known for who you are. And you come from a background whereby Christianity is, I mean, is, is recognized, is a way of life in the family. So you are expected at a certain age that you should be married. But by the time you cross a certain age and you are not married, you realize that, oh, all eyes begins uh, to look at you. People will look at you as though there's something wrong with you. They will ask you what is the matter. People will poke at your nose. People will say a lot of different things at you. And you will wonder, even you yourself, you begin to lose your self-confidence. You think there's something wrong with you. That is family pressure. Peer pressure is there, you know. And then uh, before I got married, I made up my mind. I said, Lord, no matter how old I get, I am not going to just jump into this marriage because I am from a family whereby our father left us with our mom. So I know what it means to become a single parent. And I needed the love of my husband. You know, I needed a man I could trust. I needed God to bless me with someone that would really, really bring glory of God upon my life and to the kingdom of God. So I wasn't in a rush. I told myself I would wait for God's time. And I did wait. I waited and the Lord blessed me with a wonderful husband. So when you have, you know, your reasons why you take certain steps and you do certain things, why you take your decision, you want to stand by it. Then you begin to form your mindset of expectation around your mindset. You see, so uh, only to find out later that they are not compatible or you get disappointed whereby your expectations are not realized. Now, perhaps you are already in a marriage and you feel as though you got it wrong or you're preparing to get married. Just know that God would have got committed to God and believe that he's gonna to fix your marriage and home and restore you and your spouse to his original plan for marriage. Therefore, embracing a Christ-centered marriage begins with you. Letting God into your life and allowing him to mold you and your spouse uniquely for his divine purpose. And what is this purpose? For uh, pro reprocreation and for you to raise godly offsprings for his kingdom. Marriage is not self-seeking or pursuing ungodly pleasure. Do not compare your marriage. Do not compare, oh, this person had a big wedding. This lady married a rich man. I must also look for a rich man. You, you, not you anything can... of the ungodly. Sorry, Messi. Yes. You I can, can share, share your now, screen right? now. All right, thank you. You can very share your much. screen now. Yes, I made you a host. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So kindly just wave your hands if you can see my screen. Okay, thank you. I can see one hand. Can we all see my screen? I'm sharing my screen now. Thank you. And you can do screen save. You can do a screenshot if you want to keep the content in order to help you as you move on. All right, so God can fix your marriage and home and restore you and your spouse to his original plan for your marriage. Therefore, embracing a Christ-centered marriage begins with you. You have a role to play. You have a responsibility. Letting God into your life and allowing him to mold you and your spouse uniquely for his divine purpose. And like I mentioned, what are his divine purpose for marriage? Because God originally instituted marriage. So when you can establish this fact, then you will know that you are obliged to work in obedience with this fact. You know, because God said we should reprocreate for the purpose of the kingdom. And we should raise godly offsprings. So that puts us, you know, um, on the path of God's 
rewarding us for walking in obedience. And marriage is not a place to go with a self-seeking mentality or pursuing ungodly pleasure, envying the social media display, envying the Hollywood display, and then you think that you come into marriage with such expectations. Then there's no kind of love for, I mean, um, love for, I mean, ingredient for love that will sustain such expectation. You just have a broken marriage and no comparison, no envy of the ungodly. Our ways has to be clean and righteous. Amen. Marriage is, I mean, marriage and life of a couple in a, I mean, can be likened to a journey in marriage. Courtship before marriage being the planning stage for the journey. Okay, it's a journey like uh, Offred did mention. The journey is yours. You have to package it. Marriage is a journey and it is yours. It's unique. It is not the same as every other person's own. What sustains the love in this journey? We'll see, we'll be able to liken it to the processes of traveling. That is, um, Margaret did made her own example on, I mean, about when a carpenter, you know, constructs uh, 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 furniture, the process of constructing this furniture and putting all the materials together, you're building something. So we are also likening it to home building. And I have chosen to use packaging to travel, you and your spouse. The beginning of faith is when the, is from the time of planning during your courtship. And the journey starts at the wedding. During your courtship, you put plans together, you want to organize your wedding, you first of all have your introduction done. From introduction, you go to your engagement, you get the list of uh, things for Lobola, we call it engagement, where, I mean, in West Africa, here in South Africa, we call it Lobola, you have to pay the bride price and we have to obey every step of it. Then you plan your home together, then you plan on children, you know, different, then you plan your finances, which is naturally expected. So that is when you are traveling now, you is say, I mean, it's a you can liken your marriage, the planning to travel. You liken it to the planning to travel. The couple takes off on the journey, having packed their baggages. And this represents our foundation. Who raised you? How did you grow up? What are the baggages that you carry with you? Is it anger? Is it undue expectations of your spouse? <laughs> is it that you still don't even understand who your spouse is and then you have gone into marriage with him? Because marriage is a place of covenant. You go in there with a lot of things, strongholds, you know, lineage, cultural background, different form of beliefs. And these are things that will either make your marriage work or it will act as a barrier to a successful marriage. Okay, so the marriage journey still, at the start of the journey, okay, somebody is raising a hand, thank you. We will come back to you later. I, the person is on Techno, uh, come on 15. Uh, after the presentation, please, you can put your questions through to us or through the chat box on, the, on your screen, you can send your messages. Now, at the start of the journey, they make sure to have a full tank of fuel, whatever the type of vehicle for the transportation. Now, you are sure that, oh, your man is yours. He loves you, you love him. The gauge is there. You can attest to it. You've done your marriage counseling. You have gone to do all the necessary tests. You have all the ministers assembled. Irrespective of who you're going with, anyway, you're getting married to this person because you've got hopes, because you, you've got expectations, because you believe in your spouse to be, okay? The success and pleasantness of the journey depends on a lot of factors, including the skill of the driver, and the behavior of the passenger. Now, the Bible makes us understand that the men are the head of the home. They are the priests in our home, okay? And we are their helpmates, okay? Now, we are the passenger, and your husband is there to lead, to drive this car. What skills does he possess? Does he have a valid driver's license? Is he an experienced driver? 
Now, has he learned the basic skills in driving? So the word of God that you accept into your heart, has it equipped you for your marriage? Besides the mechanical fitness of the vehicle and the skill of the driver, the major element that will sustain the journey at each point will be the level of the fuel in the fuel tank. What is your understanding of Christ-centered marriage? What do you expect to get in your marriage at the point of your planning? What was it that the Lord spoke to your heart and gave to you as a word or a tool that will sustain your journey? Now, let me cite my own example to you. At the early stage in my marriage, there were turbulence. It's normal, but God equipped me. He gave me a tool to say, my child, I will be with you and I will walk with you all the way. Come rain, some, come sunshine. No matter what the trouble may be, I will stand with you. Allow me to use you for, a, for my purpose. Let me use you to bring a smile on somebody's face. And within that will I bless you. The word of God kept coming back to me that when I saw the reason to be angry, when I had every query in my heart concerning marriage, God gave me back his words and his words will not go void. His words does not return to him empty. I said, Lord, you gave me your word and this is it. Handle the marriage for me. I'm not wise. I'm not skillful enough. My husband isn't skillful enough. We both won this marriage and we love you. We prepared and came into it. All right. So we prepared and we came into this marriage expecting that we grow all together and your presence will sustain us. Now, in marriage, love represents the fuel for the journey of your marriage. Love at full gauge. My, I took my test from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 48. For the benefit of the time, Please, uh, I will implore you at your private time, you can go through these scriptures. Okay, so I'll just run through. You have the love indicator, or we rather say love gauge. When your love gauge is at the full tank, of course, everything looks beautiful. Love covers a multitude of sin and wrongs. The couple look at each other through rose-colored glasses because love has taken over. You know, love suffers long the long suffering, they are patient with each other. Kindness is expressed. Couples go out of their way to show kindness to each other. When you are in love, everything is possible. Envy and suspicions are absent. Love does not envy. Complete trust is at play. They believe in each other, hold great hopes for their union and no jealousy. I will not be jealous of you that you earn more money than me or I am any more than you and no boastful or flaunt itself or then glorious. Okay, the couple have, have, um, have real respect and consideration for each other's opinion and inputs. Not seeking one's way at all times. You have regard. You see, nobody is complete. We are all human and we have our shortcomings. So you respect your husband even when he makes error. You respect your wife even when she makes a mistake, knowing fully well that, okay, this is who she is and we can make amends and then we continue in the godly relationship that we are nurturing. Not puffed up, not rude. Love at full gauge promotes mutual respect. You respect one another. You don't use one person as your footstool. You don't use one person as your flip your servant or your flip flop in the bathroom, not seeking its own. Selfishness is held in check. Selfless, you got to be selfless for your marriage to, to survive and have you know, pure love that will sustain you and drive you as long as the Lord himself keeps you together and keeps you alive, you need not be selfish. 
selfishness need to be removed for your love to come to play. Not easily provoked. When you are in love, when love is at full gauge, your full tank is there. You are not easily provoked. It's not like, oh, as you're traveling, your quail is about to finish. Maybe it's on the, it's on the amber, amber line and you're wondering, oh, where is the next filling station? Where is the next gas station? Where can I fill up? Then you start to panic. You know, you are not provoked. You are not angry that now you're about to stop where you're about to spend money. You're about, you, know, you are running out of petrol. You are not in panic mode. Even the couple's thought lives are clean, not imagining or wishing evil for each other, does not rejoice in iniquity. Love does not rejoice in iniquity. If there is occasion of pain, the spouse is empathetic, not secretly or openly saying, this serves you right. Your Pain is my pain. My pain is your pain. Our children's pain will be our pain. Okay? Because when you ignore this aspect, then you are not embracing the ingredients that will promote your love. Rejoice in the truth. The overflowing of love of the couple for each other causes the expression of supernatural levels of trust and patience and hope. Amen. Now, love at full gauge bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. You know, when there is love, hope is alive for the yet unseen glorious tomorrow that the marriage promises. I mean, I mean, when you, when you are in love, you are united. The word of God in Amos chapter 3 verse 3 says, can two work together except they agree? How do you think alike when you don't agree? How do you work together in harmony and in trust when you don't agree? So hope all things. When there is love, hope is alive. Amen. Endures all things. Perseverance, you know, extreme endurance. When there is lack, when there is, uh, like uh, Alfred said, uh, when there is financial drought, you can stand together. You know, there's endurance. You don't chicken out. You don't run away. You know, you don't allow the love to die. You continue to hold hands, trust God, still love each other, you know, and make things work for you. Because if you don't build it, love cannot just build itself. Like I said, love is an act. Love never fails. Perhaps some aspect of your marriage are not really what they used to be. You are failing. Check your love gauge. You might just be running on empty tank. All right. So always have a point of assessment. Go back, sit down with your spouse. Uh, reassess where you are at. Always spend time in reevaluating your marriage, your relationship, everything that gives you that marriage, everything that makes you to fall in love. Like when we counsel people, we normally refer them to say, go back to your old videos. We give them, we recommend books for them to read. We say, get your wedding videos or pictures, go over it, call your children, make something, you know, remember something that makes you laugh. Then you start reevaluating. And while reevaluating, remember when you run on, a, on an empty tank, your car will get stopped. You cannot continue on that journey. If you are in the middle of nowhere, you're stuck, you will wave people down to help you to the next gas station so you get petrol to come back to pour into your car for you to be able to move from there. All right, so at this point, you no longer experience love, you no longer experience tenderness. Patience and rudeness becomes the order of the day. I mean, impatience, easily provoked. Very little thing gets you off. Like Ofre said, that is like an eggshell. Okay, it was Maggie. When you stand on an eggshell, when there is no love, everything becomes sensitive. You become emotional. Meanness becomes the order of the day. Envy, suspicion, and evil imagination takes over. We are the product, first of all, of the content of our heart. And before you know it, fear sets in. Before you know every other thing would creep in. And that is not needed. When you run on an empty, you start promoting yourself. Your ego will pop out. You want to be noticed. 
you want to be the head as the woman that works very hard in the family. Meanwhile, it's not even necessary. It's all being glory, you know. That and if we had just taken over, of, uh, of vengeance and the word of evil for all the pain and disappointment. <laughs> Sorry, please, can you mute yourself so we don't interrupt? Thank you. So thoughts of vengeance easily breed forgiveness. That the first thought that comes to your mind towards your spouse is how to forgive so that you can enjoy a smooth relationship. First thing that comes to your chance. Time to repel. Welcome to the feeling station. All right. Now we have realized that we need to repel. We need to carry on in this marriage because there is no second option of divorce or separation. Why? Not just because you feel hurt and you think you why that. We don't have to be full of self because now two has become one and we are working together as one. Their understanding. And God blessing it that you now have children, you have offsprings, and you don't want these offsprings, God's children, to fall out of God's purpose. You need to now know that it's time, recognize the point at which you need to repel your love. You need to get it back. You need to get back to the basics, which is very crucial in the Christ-centered marriage. So welcome to the feeling session. This seminar offers a great opportunity to repel. So love is not passive. It needs to be expressed. Love is an act. You need to put action to love for it to work for you. you. You need to know how to express the language of love. Love is an act. Love has a language. Love is a practice. Love is something that is present. Love is something that you have to put action to. It will not act itself. So you need to put action to express and to show love. God expressed his love by giving his only begotten son, giving him up to die for our sins and to bring us redemption. So God acted. God didn't just preach love and he left it like that. He gave us examples of love and uh, he likened the love of family to that of his to the church. So we need to embrace this practice and the principle is like saying the formula for mathematics is two plus two and so it is. It is supernatural when you do not obey the principle and, and, and the, what you need to work with to achieve this love, then you cannot sustain the marriage. Many times we communicate love but our communication gets lost on our spouses. We need to learn and understand each other's love language. Time for restoring, for restoration is now. The time to restore our relationship, our marriage is now. God's purpose and design for marriage, like Maggie mentioned, God has a purpose for instituting marriage. Yeah, for instituting marriage. And when we discover and align our pursuit in marriage to God's plan and purposes, we then obtain God's reward in our marriage. God purposefully created marriage to reflect our relationship with God. In Ephesians chapter 5, our marriage should reflect the mystery of God's love for the church. So if you're not yet there, then you know that you have work to do. So you have a responsibility. God's purpose, again, is to produce godly offspring, like I earlier mentioned. In Malachi 2.15, God's plan is for our marriage to create the safe environment to raise godly children. In the nurture and admonition of God. Display God's covenant promises. Hebrews uh, chapter 13, verse 5. God will never leave 
nor forsake us. Our marriage union needs to reflect this, this level of commitment to each other. And that is our covenant with God and in our marriage. Therefore, now I'm going to take us through the keys to a successful marriage. Okay. Marriage is a call to an intimate, open relationship. Therefore, many barriers to us being fully open and intimate with each other. These barriers need to come down so that we can be restored as married couples to proper to the proper functioning of our marriage. The following keys will help bring unity and sense of belonging. In a marriage where there is no sense of belonging, at some point in my marriage, at the early stage of my marriage, two years into my marriage, I had difficulty. I would often tell, no, I, I often told my husband that, look, I don't have sense of belonging. I told him I wanted more friendship because you know why? I had a premeditated mindset that I brought into my marriage. One, because I didn't experience the love of my father as a parent. I had that mindset, I had that image in my head that any man that marries me would make up for these lapses, which I experienced as a kid. So I came with my baggage. Remember, I had likened marriage journey to our normal traveling, you know, the process of packing to travel. We go with our bags. I came with my own baggage. He also came with his own baggage. And having to deal with these baggages has taken some years. But with God's help, God helped us to listen effectively to one another. And we were able to resolve it. Today, we are best of friends. In fact, he's my biggest fan and nothing comes between us. Without him, I wouldn't even be here. Then having gone through these journeys in life, I realized that no, marriages needed to be healed out there. We needed to help others. We needed to transform marriages, transform homes, transform lives. And that was why we now decided, we went into counseling. So we began to counsel families, pre-marriage counseling and marriage counseling. At whatever level you are at, we were able to support and to give you godly counseling, not, a not as a psychologist that we just fulfill pen and paper theories. No, the godly way, the biblical way, the main purpose that God created marriage for. Now, effective communication. All the speakers of the day have said one, said one or two things about communication. Where communication lacks in a relationship, you cannot be able to sustain love because there is no love without communication. You cannot see what is in my heart. You cannot see what I wish for you in the physical. You can only be able to ascertain my mind towards you only when I speak it. You, the love becomes tangible through communication, communicating through every area of your journey, taking care of every aspect and passing knowledge and information to your partner or to your spouse. Then you can talk about love. Spirituality, pray together. Have your quiet time together. A marriage, a relationship, a large prayer, cannot be sustained because seven because the devil and its agent is oh, oh, yeah, the one today, no? yeah. Maggie, please can you mute everyone please except can, myself? can everybody mute please thank you thank you for muting mm -hmm. Okay, then. Yeah, so they have one on one now. In this game, please, Joe and them. Can you mute your mics? All right. So, spirituality, I'm back here. Pray together. Serve together. Find your purpose. Discover your calling as a couple. Be involved in your local church. Be involved in the ministry. Because when there is vacuum, of course, 
anything can happen. Everything will go in there. But when you serve the Lord righteously, he rewards your diligence. And he will not let your home fall in array. Because let me tell you one thing. When, you're, when you serve, something will put you in check. Something will tell you that your love gauge is dropping. Then you cannot be careless. You cannot be careless. You cannot just throw caution to the wind because you know you are called. And there is the purpose of God happening in your life. So you will be careful. Words of affirmation. Words of affirmation, gratitude still. Tell your spouse that you're thankful for having him or her in your life. Empathize with your spouse. You know, show, show it. When you feel it, show it. Be open with your feelings. Be, be, I mean, put action to it. Don't just wait for when you go to sleep in bed. Don't wait for that nighttime where you trip off the light. Don't wait for that moment when you feel longing to touch your wife. No, words of affirm affirmation. Thank you. You're beautiful. You're fantastic. You are the best person to happen to me in my life. There is no other person beside me except you. Because of course, you know, you do not have an option. That is who you're stuck with and this is your husband. So choose to see the beautiful things in that your spouse. Choose to praise him. Don't go out there and give honor and glory to another person's husband or somebody else's wife. Honoring them and refusing to give words of affirmation to your wife or to your husband. Quality time. Be available for you two as a couple. Be friends. Plan for some personal time. Now, when I sense that friendship was lacking in my marriage, not as if we were fighting, not as though we were not living together in peace, but I was one person who, I mean, I, I wasn't so demanding. I can keep quiet and just let go and keep bearing it, long suffering, you know, I just keep bearing it. But at a point, I noticed that, oh, I'm so carried away with doing things, being busy. My husband was so carried away, just putting bread on the table. I would go after my businesses. I will give time to others, you know, fulfilling the purpose on that side, but forgetting that my husband also meant a lot and we needed to be friends. So I told him, I said, we are not friends enough. We needed to tighten that relationship. So we be, then we walked towards it consciously in prayer and in action. Now, we now decided to be doing things together. So we do a lot of things together. So even when we don't have the private time in our homes to show friendship, we have other ways in which we practice friendship. Okay, so we spend quality time together. If you're planning to get married, just in case you're not married, or we have the unmarried ones among us who are waiting to be married, and by God's grace, that would happen by the grace of God. If you're planning to get married, if you're somebody with a kind of personality who likes to do on the couch, holding a bowl of popcorn in your hands, then you know there are some other people also that once they get triggered, they just take you straight to bed and the next thing is sex. They can't sit with you for three hours to watch a movie. Then you, they will, they will be, that would be overbearing on them. So you need to check it properly. And perhaps you're already married. And you're the type that loves such. Now work at it. Communicate with your spouse. Tell us why this is my love language. This is what I like to do. Then work on it. Give time. Be patient. And if it's not coming, don't break the walls about that. Enjoy what the Lord has placed on your table. And do not compare. Now, personal time, it is not wrong for you to choose to have a personal time. Especially when it comes to quiet time, when you want to cry unto your heavenly father for those things that you cannot change, for those things that you do not have control over, and you desire to have a sustainable love in your marriage, then you know that you need a quiet time. There's nothing wrong with that, but do not take the quiet time for too long. And also do it in understanding and in agreement with your spouse. Keys to a successful marriage. Your finance. Be open and communicate about your state of finances. Plan and execute projects together. Financial stewardship and attain financial independence as a couple. 
let me tell you, most marriages today will break because of lack of sex. It will break because of lack of transparency in finances. It will break because of, you know, um, um, infidelity. And finance came as number one reason for divorce today. But when you do things together, you plan your projects together, you know, yes, it works for different people differently. Yes, my husband and I, we have a business account. We have one joint and we have our in the account. We make plans, we make budgets. Even when he has to spend money behind me, he will still tell me, look, my darling, I had to do this. I had to give so, so amount of money to somebody because it was urgent and I couldn't help it. I couldn't wait to see you. We need, I needed to send money to someone because they were sick. But you see, he will not still walk outside what he already knows that we could agree on. So be open in communication about your finances. Do things together. My husband and I became much, much more closer when we now had a business that we're running together. Something must bring you together. I told you love is not an object, it's an act, it's something that you work towards. Now give and receive gifts. What does your spouse want? What do they like? My husband will go and buy me chocolate. I'm not a chocolate person, I'm a health freak because I know my nutrition and dietetics and I know what is good for me. And I'll ask him, why are you buying me chocolate? Okay, even if you must buy me chocolate, please buy the darkest 100% dark chocolate because I'm not going to eat this. You will have it there in the fridge for many months. You can trust me, I won't touch it, you know. The children will eventually eat it. But if he buys me broccoli or he brings me a flower, yesterday he got me a very beautiful bouquet flower and I love it so much it's still there in on my dining table so give gift and receive gift even if you don't like it appreciate it show some show some level of appreciation let you know is the thought behind buying it and there are some people that that becomes their love language they love it so much having the thought to even remember them to buy them most of my shoes my husband buys them he will just see them there he will order the shoes the next thing he brings shoes on. Whether I like it or not, I'll start wearing it. And I see that he loves it, you see. So he will tell me, I love toys. When he says he loves toys, it means he wants gadgets. He likes phones. He likes computers. He likes cars. He like, you know. So I know what to get him if I want to get him a gift. And if I cannot afford it, I will not go to break the bank. If it's an apple that you find to buy, it's okay. So don't copy someone and do not compare your relationship with others. Please do not buy a house as a surprise for your spouse. I would say no, because the repercussion will come where you have to pay the bills and you cannot pay or you are in debt. In this system where we are in South Africa or in other part of the world except Nigeria, credit system is a serious thing. So don't get into it hoping that you're going to surprise your wife, then the, the debt collectors come, then that can now be a barrier to your marriage. Understand that it's okay to disagree. Act of service, support each other in every area. Is it chores, cook a meal, laundry? That binds your love together, that brings you together. That is another love language. Some people appreciate when you serve them, serve them breakfast in bed. You know, even like me, I don't like my husband cooking because when he cooks I'll go and start cleaning all the mess but when he cooks for me I enjoy the children will tell oh daddy this is good and let's surprise mommy you, you see it gives him joy doing so but I am thinking about what I have to do afterwards anyway praise God for that if you live in diaspora you know what it means to multitask and still be a successful uh, woman in all spheres all right, then physical touch. Is it sex? Are you compatible? Let me quickly tell you something. We concluded pre-marriage course uh, last, uh, this past week, uh, Thursday, which was two days ago. And one of the things I spoke about was what starvation of sex can cause or when you are not compatible. If you're already in marriage, and this you can only find out when you're in marriage, please be content. If you know that you want better than that, build each other up. When I just got married, let me give you one top secret. My husband is not here now. He would tell me you are tight. I'm like, how do I do it? What do you mean I'm tight? What do you want me to do? 
you see, I believe we are speaking to mature minds here. Then gradually I began to realize, he began to uh, groom me, he began to groom me. And today we are fit and we are just good enough for each other. Don't make room for your spouse to go out there to look for satisfaction. That is another cause for divorce today. That is another reason why love doesn't grow in homes, in families. And it flows down to the children by the time you start having kids. Hand holding. My husband is a shy man. He will not hold hands in the public, but I make him do it anyway because I love it. That's part of my own love language. Then have your pet name. Build trust and learn to forgive. I have a chat here. Now, learn to understand each other's love language. On this chat, this love language that we are talking about does not speak evil. It doesn't speak Ijo, it doesn't speak Yoruba, Ebira. It doesn't even speak Zulu that we speak here in South Africa. It doesn't speak English as I speak to you now. No, love language is discovering the act that will communicate your intentions to your spouse. Okay, so we have words of affirmation. You can save this um, chat. You can do a screenshot. Spoken word, written cards and letters. I remember in those days when guys want to toast us, then there were no technology like this. There was no internet, no, you know, tech, you know this kind of thing. Now, you write a letter and you put doxology, you put ditto, you know, all those kind of funny, funny stuff when a man wants to ask you out or ask for your hands in marriage, they will come with all manner of things. I remember hiding a letter under my pillow and my immediate other sister came around and saw it. Oh, that got me into trouble. I didn't even know what I was doing. A guy just gave me a letter and I hid it there. So now we are saying, speak the word to your spouse. You are in the safe environment of marriage, instituted by God. It is approved, it is genuine, it is acceptable. Speak it to your wife, write it on a card, text it on your phone. In fact, go and flaunt it on Facebook. Let your spouse see it and be happy and feel secured and have that sense of security and sense of belong. Yes, it belongs to you and you belong to him. Amen. Encourage Word that is a compliment affirming spray, like words of affirmation, like emotionally harsh words, undue criticism. You see, we all have weaknesses, we have things that could act as barriers. We are meant to complement one another. We are not perfect people. Your husband's weakness or your wife's there for you to complement one another. I want to tell you that this presentation couldn't have been possible without my husband. I am a God-do person. I am the one that will run. I take initiative. I do everything. But my administrative aspect, I've got my husband's backing because he writes. He's an author. I will just give him my concept. And before you know it, before I wake up in the morning, everything is done after having ministered to him. So what I'm telling you is thing, where he makes a mistake or he spills water on the floor, or he presses that uh, toothpaste tube the way you don't like if a meticulous person in the bathroom, just do not criticize. Don't use harsh words. Be able to contain each other, okay? Now, quality time, like I said, running errands, taking trips, you know, spend time together, travel together, leave the children alone at that time. You see, communicate, quiet places with no interruption. Get one-on-one -on -one conversation. Tell him the way you want him to touch you. Tell him what you love about what he does to you. Tell him what you like about, you know, the way he spoke to your parents. Do not allow families or friends to interfere because this is your journey. This is for your happiness and for your lasting tomorrow. Now, two more time with friends or group isolation, gaps of time between meetings. Yes, things to avoid. Also avoid too many friends that are not adding value to your marriage. Don't hang out with negative influences. We have some people, they are celebrities, 
But the only thing they have to show you is how not to tolerate your husband or your wife's shortcomings. Please watch out. So when you give gifts, remembering special occasion, give small token. Private gifts, yes, pleasant facial expressions. You know how to make those eye contacts. When we are in public, my husband knows. When I look, he knows what I mean. When he looks at me, I know what he means. Or when there are people in the house and he wants to give me a tap that, look, I love you, remember this. There's a way he does it. He's so good with it. And I love it. That's another love language for me. So discover your spouse's love language. Is it the act of service? Is it physical touch? So we have different personalities. Discover your spouse's love language and just make him feel the head or the supporter that he or she is to you in your life and always appreciate one another by doing it right. Don't just communicate, but communicate the love language that suits your spouse. Recognize it. If you don't know it, ask questions. My husband will often ask me, okay, how do I do this? What do you want me to do? Because I will always speak out. He doesn't speak out as much as me. My husband is on the quiet side. If you know me very well, you know I like to talk, especially when I'm making sense and I want to pass effective information across to you. I will talk and I like him sitting down, spending time with me and having these talks with me. <laughs> now, fixing the love machine. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 to 32. We are about to round off. Let all bitterness wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you. The choice and power to let go is in your hands. Healing starts as you let go and embrace forgiveness. First of all, the benefit of the forgiveness is for you. Sickness can create a barrier in the family, even in your marriage. So diseases, you know, unwellness. And when you embrace unforgiveness, you're just calling upon yourself the wrath of God. And you don't want that to get you to a, on a sick table because you will no longer have a relationship. So forgive for your own good first as Christ forgives you or forgave you. Okay. And be kind to one another. Tender hearted. Allow the return of kindness. Forgive one another. God set us, set us as an example of forgiveness. Let us give way to forgiveness and healing. Amen. No matter what you're going through, I want to assure you today that Christ is not leaving you. He died for you too. He forgave you. He died for your sins, for my sins. When you forgive, you make way for God to also forgive you and heal you. He will heal your relationship. He will heal your marriage. He will heal every aspect of your life that you truly look up to him for. All right. So, Parting thoughts and counsel to you today. You need to know when, how, and the appropriate quarters to seek help when your marriage is in trouble. Amen.